All right, for the last session in this room, I think, I'm not entirely sure, uh, today we have Nick Coglin. He's a, Python, a C Python core developer, BDFL for the Python packaging world, came up or was a found, or is a founding, man manager, founding member of the Python packaging working group. And when he's not doing packaging in Python, he's working in the release process in Red, at Red Hat in the platform engineering team. And well, today he's going to talk to us about front-end integration testing with Splinter, whatever that is. Yes. But I suppose he's going to tell us. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah. Uh, so yes, so I'm not actually talking about any of that stuff today. Uh, what I'm talking about uh, is I like words, uh, and I like programming uh, environments that let me work mostly with words. Uh, so things like command line interfaces, uh, back-end server APIs, that kind of stuff. Uh, however, uh, we don't always get to do what we want. Uh, and in my case, not getting to do what I want means having to write a GUI. Uh, and I really don't like this. Uh, there's too many degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, I just am not a fan of front-end GUI development. Uh, but I do need to do it. Uh, and I need to learn how to do it. And I need to be confident doing it. Um, and so what Splinter is, uh, is Splinter is a convenience wrapper around Selenium and related web driver backends for particular browsers. Uh, and the reason I find it interesting uh, is that in combination with the beautiful soup HTML parsing library, uh, I find it makes front-end web UI testing almost as straightforward as back-end API testing. Uh, and easy end-to-end -end integration testing makes me far more willing to spend time learning to create my own user interfaces uh, rather than just relying solely on back-end APIs uh, and front-end command line interface and saying, oh, the GUI is somebody else's problem. Because sometimes it is my problem. But before we get further into the front-end side of things, I first want to talk about that end-to-end -end integration testing aspect. Like, what do I mean when I say end-to-end -end integration testing? And for that, I'm going to talk about a thing called behavior-driven development. Behavior-driven development emphasizes tests of user-visible system behavior as a key tool in ensuring that the software we write meets user expectations. So if it's a system we're developing professionally uh, in order to address somebody else's problem, uh, then the scenarios may actually be defined beforehand. Uh, so we say, what do we want the software to do before we even write a single line of code? Uh, however, it's useful even for stuff we write for ourselves. Uh, it's just that when we write it for ourselves, what we'll often do is we'll write the code first. Uh, and then what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to do a way to describe what it already does so that we don't break it when we rip the guts out and replace it with something shiny and cool and new that we want to play with. Um, so what does that actually look like in practice? And the big thing about behavior-driven development uh, is that desired behavior is defined as scenarios. Uh, and so as my running example, I'm going to use a piece of a side project I'm currently working on uh, that will eventually track how long it takes for new Python releases to actually make it all the way through our various uh, distribution channels. So through the Linux distros, through our commercial redistributors, uh, onto the online programming platforms. Uh, how long does it take from when we publish it upstream to when users can actually get access it through their preferred channel? Uh, the specific piece that's of relevance today, all it does is it stores and reports details about Python implementation release dates. Uh, and so the scenario you can see on the screen here is a pretty typical example of a behavioral test case. Uh, so first, we start by defining the initial conditions in given clauses. So here, to run this test scenario, we're going to need some example releases in the database. Uh, and we're going to need to have a local test server running. Otherwise, the test isn't going to be very interesting. Uh, then we have when clause that defines user actions or other events. So for this scenario, the only user action that's happening is we're just querying the releases collection. Say, say to the API server, tell me about all the releases you know about. Uh, and then finally, the expected outcomes of that user action are specified as then clauses. So here we say, well, we want the request to succeed, uh, and we want the details of that request to actually include all the releases that we set up originally. And so the thing about behavior-driven development is these scenarios are designed to be readable and sometimes even writable 
by folks that wouldn't normally consider themselves to be programmers. Uh, and so to quickly try and show that in action, uh, I'm just going to ask the demo gods to be kind uh, and switch out to a command window. And so just running a very simple test case here, we'll just start it running, it loads the database, gives the timing of all those steps, and then says, yep, everything's fine. Very cool, very happy. Uh, and so, back to that. So yeah, so very simple, not the thing. But what actually happened then? Like what went on behind the scenes of that scenario? Um, and so those individual steps are themselves still defined as code. Uh, and so this particular step definition uh, is written using the behave testing framework uh, and the requests HTTP client library. Uh, and so behave, uh, Behave is a test framework where the main object you're working with is a scenario context. Uh, and so all of the steps in a scenario share that context. They can read it, they can write to it. Uh, and so here we can see that one of the setup steps, the one that started the server, will have added the server's API URL uh, to the context. So in this step, we, could we don't need to worry about where the server came from. We just grab it from the context, query the URL that we're interested in, uh, and then whatever answer we get back, we just store it on the context. It's not this step's problem to say what should that context look like. That's part of the expected outcome steps. Um, and then the other piece this is showing is that you don't have to write every step individually. You, you, just, you just parameterize your steps. So in this case, this same step can be used to query any collection that the server offers. Uh, in our particular scenario, we're just using it to query the releases collection. Um, and then requests is just a brilliant testing library for Python. Uh, it's used for all sorts of things, but for testing purposes, it's excellent for API testing. And in behave, your step parameters aren't limited to just text. Uh, so for example, one of our expected outcomes uh, is that we wanted to know that the status was 200 okay. Uh, and so here we say in the step definition, not only is the expected status something that's on the end of the step, uh, but we actually filter it and say, this should be uh, converted as an integer. Uh, and behave uses, a, by default, a passing library called parse. Uh, and it's essentially the inverse of string.format. Uh, so the same kind of formatting codes that you use in string formatting, you get to use in parse as well. Uh, and it's just very neat, very readable uh, for people who know Python string formatting. Um, now, the other piece shown here is that step definitions need a way to make assertions about the expected outcomes of a scenario. Uh, and so while behave itself uh, works with any library that throws assertion error for failed assertions, uh, the specific library shown here uh, is called PyHamcrest. Uh, and the way PyHamcrest works is you build up um, declarative assertions. So here, a very simple one, we just say the expectation we're setting is that some value is going to be equal to the expected status. Uh, and then you use the assert that command to say, this value will meet this condition. Um, and the expectations don't have to be specified in the step itself. Uh, we can actually set the expectations based on the initial conditions. Uh, and so that's what that last all given releases should be reported uh, does. Uh, as we can see here, what, we've, what that original step actually does is it saves what it loaded into the database uh, onto the context as these are the given releases that we loaded. Uh, and it means that in this expectation step, we can compare the API response that was saved by the user action step to the given releases that were saved by the setup step. Uh, and then we use Hamcrest to say, uh, we can say that we expect these entries, we expect them in any order. Uh, we expect this, the number of entries we get to be the same as the ones we loaded. Uh, and basically, you end up with a lot of test cases like that. Uh, and you're working with JSON data, and it's all just very nice, very simple, um, as long as you're using, used to working with those kinds of data structures. But the beauty of it is that all of those low-level details of how the API works and JSON and all that sort of stuff 
That's hidden in the step definitions. That's the stuff the programmers deal with defining new steps. Uh, and taken together, all of those different scenario step definitions create the project step catalog. And that step catalog then becomes a common vocabulary for your project about what your system does, uh, about what the user actions are in the when steps, what the expected outcomes for users are in the then steps, uh, and then the given steps are basically all the initial conditions that you set up for your different testing scenarios. Uh, and so, and then the step catalog and your behavioral testing framework combined to create a domain specific language for describing scenarios about what your system does. Uh, and that's, a, that's then the essence of behavioral driven development. Uh, that, we, that you have a way of saying, this is how we expect this system to work for these needs. So that's the course concepts behind integration testing and end-to-end -end integration testing. But where does GUI testing come into this? Like, this is a talk about Splinter, not about behave. Well, OK, it's about behave as well, because behave is cool. Um, and what it boils down to this, like in my own head, like I am a back-end developer. I am a command line developer. I do not think of myself as a front-end developer. And it's like I prefer to focus on data pipelines and low-level plumbing all the stuff that normal sensible people just say and then magic happens. And I like magic, it's fun. Um, but good magic is indistinguishable. No, hang on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, if, te if technology is distinguishable from magic, it's insufficiently advanced. That's the version I wanted. Um, and so yeah, so I like that thing where it's mostly about automated systems talking to each other and the only humans that deal with it are the ones actually working on it. However, being able to put together at least a basic front end, check that it does that what you expect it to do, and check that it's possible for people to use your API to write a sensible front end, that's actually a really useful skill. Uh, and it's one that I've been interested in learning uh, to expand on. And so for me personally, that's where Splinter comes in. I like Splinter because it means that all those skills that I've already developed for testing back-end APIs, uh, I can then adapt uh, to testing front-ends. Uh, and that then gives me confidence that I know what my front-end is doing, uh, gives me confidence to publish them, and say, hey, yep, this is usable, it's not gonna break, uh, this is fine. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna go through next. Now, there are plenty of other good reasons to like Splinter, uh, and I actually learned about it from an excellent front-end UX designer. Um, but this is the reason why I uh, started using it. And so, what would a front-end uh, browser-based testing scenario look like? Well, it looks remarkably similar to the one we already saw earlier. Almost identical, in fact. Um, and so we get to reuse our existing setup steps because we're running it in the same system. We don't need to change any of that. Um, but we do need a new user action. Uh, instead of querying, an, querying a collection, they're now visiting a page. Uh, and we also define new steps uh, about the expectations we're setting. So rather than checking a status code, we're saying, well, did we get the page title we wanted? Uh, rather than checking whether the API response was the one we expected, we're checking are the versions we expected to see uh, the same. And so let's dive into those new step definitions and see how they compare to some of our uh, earlier ones. So the big difference here is that where we were previously using requests to talk to the API directly, we're now using Splinter to control uh, a uh, web API, uh, sorry, a web browser, uh, and then giving that browser instructions to go connect to the uh, full HTML interface rather than the back-end API. Uh, and one of the bits of complexity that this introduces is that setting up a full browser instance is like kind of slow. Um, and we'll see a bit more about that later. Uh, and, but there's various things you can do to kind of mitigate that and save your browser and reset the cookie cache rather than starting a whole new instance and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so Splinter does some very nice APIs uh, for dealing with that. Uh, but this is uh, one of the other reasons why I really like Splinter uh, is that it offers APIs like this click link by text where instead of giving a very fine-grained command of, I'll oh, look for this particular HTML tag ID, 
or look for this particular CSS selector, those are things that humans can't see. So while Splinter does let you do that, it also lets you do things like click link by text. And if you have user instructions in your documentation, you're not gonna say, click on the link with this HTML ID. You're gonna say, click on this link text. And so what this lets you do is it lets you write your scenarios and write your step definitions the same way a human would actually follow them uh, in, in, your, in your documentation. Uh, but the overall complexity of that is three lines. Oh, five lines if you count the function header. And that's basically as simple as our request thing. Uh, there's not much complicated at all. If we can use requests, we can use Splinter. And then the other thing that Splinter does is it provides us with access to check the browser state. Uh, and so in this particular step, we're saying, well, we want to see what the page title was. Uh, and so we get the browser from the context and say, well, tell me what the title is. And we compare that to the one uh, in the, in the, in the uh, step definition. And then finally, the other thing we want to do is, so this particular example that I'm going through, the thing that's challenging with it is that what it does is it displays data in a data table. Uh, so, so far, so good. If you're doing server-side rendering, you don't need Splinter at all for this. You just get the HTML out of requests, look through the data, uh, and you're done. The problem with this service is it doesn't render the data table on the server. Uh, what it does is use a JavaScript library called data tables, makes the API query to the server, gets the, uh, gets the response, and then renders that as the table. And so what this scenario is actually trying to check is it's not trying to check the data. What it's trying to check is that have I implemented that bit correctly? Have I actually got the data that we loaded from the server? Have I rendered it correctly into the data table? And so that means I need a full JavaScript engine to do that. Like, you can't do that with requests because requests will just give you the HTML without actually running any of the data, uh, any of the JavaScript in it. You can't do it with Mechanize because it has the same problem. It doesn't have the JavaScript engine. But because we're actually running a full browser here, the browser actually does the full test for us. Uh, and so actually running that test with the browser rather than the web API It means all we need to do is to say run the different scenario and it will go run the full scenario for us. I have no idea where it's gonna open the browser window. Oh, there we go. Best possible outcome, that's where I wanted it to show up. Uh, and so testing that front end API then become, uh, that front end web page uh, then becomes just as straightforward uh, as testing the back end API was, which means I'm a lot happier writing GUIs because I can say, I can far more easily say, is that GUI going to do what I want? Uh, and then make sure that what I implement matches my intended behavior. Uh, and so yeah, and so as a back-end guy, this is a way of writing GUIs that I actually like. Um, so that's basically, uh, hang on, back to the slides. So that's the, like the main uh, front-end behavioral testing example, uh, and that has hopefully convinced people that are comfortable with testing APIs, that testing front-ends doesn't need to be any more difficult. Um, but in the remaining time, I'll go through a few different tips and tricks uh, I picked up along the way in discovering that, uh, that I could do this. Um, one of the things I picked up along the way, you still want to use requests for your actual HTTP protocol testing. Uh, browsers are big, complicated beasts where one page visit may uh, trigger a whole pile of distinct HTTP requests. Uh, I think someone mentioned in a talk earlier that opening up, the home, uh, opening up a Slack channel will make like 60 requests in the background. Uh, and so as a result, even though Splinter does provide a status code attribute, the notion of a HTTP status code for a full browser page visit, it's not clear how much sense it actually makes. Uh, and one of the consequences of it is the status code may be 200 when you think it shouldn't have been. Uh, so basically, if you're wanting to test for particular HTTP status codes and other kind of low-level protocol details, that's still the world of requests. Splinter's mainly gonna come in 
when you actually want the full JavaScript rendering engine on the front end, uh, and you're actually wanting to check that the JavaScript is doing what you expect. Um, learning Selenium, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, all that sort of stuff's still useful. Like, Splint is a very nice abstraction layer, but it's still an abstraction layer. Uh, and so just as the core concepts and requests come from HTTP, many of the concepts in Splinter come from the under, under the, those underlying implementation layers of HTML uh, web-based presentation. Uh, and so while Splinter makes it possible to do things we might currently have no idea how to write ourselves, um, like I use a, I use a front-end web library that Red Hat's design and UX people wrote called Pattonfly. I have no idea how to do half the stuff that does, less than half. Um, and, so, uh, and so Splinter lets me test things that I don't know how to write, but I can at least make sure they're doing the thing that I want them to show to the user. Uh, and so that's very cool. Uh, but at the same time, if I want to debug it, then I'm going to have to learn something. Uh, and that's cool too. It means I can do needs-based learning and learn things as I need to debug them. And that's actually my favorite way of learning stuff. Uh, the other, th oh. sorry. Uh, the other thing is uh, CI environments don't tend to actually have monitors attached to them. I'm sure there are some, uh, but uh, they're. Uh, it's certainly not something you get for, you're going to get for free in Travis CI. Uh, fortunately, uh, for that use case, uh, Linux has a concept called X Virtual Frame Buffers, uh, and that's generally enough to let you run a full full browser like Firefox or Chromium or something like that. Um, there are drivers for headless browsers and detect director framework backends uh, for Splinter, uh, and they can be useful in certain contexts. Uh, the reason I didn't use it. Uh, is that for my particular application, for whatever reason, it doesn't actually run in PhantomJS. Uh, and I don't actually care whether it runs in PhantomJS, I care whether it runs in Firefox. Uh, so it was far more sensible for me to just say, use, for, use Firefox in CI, set up XS, XVF, uh, uh, X frame buffers so that Firefox will run in CI without a browser otherwise attached. Um, one of the other things, uh, one of the beauties of APIs uh, is whatever you ask the server for is the re request response based. So you send the request, you get the response back. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about race conditions. Um, client side rendering, that's very racy. Uh, like it is very easy to have your test. Uh, it is very easy to have your test kick, kick off the page visit and then start making assertions about it before the JavaScript's finished running. Um, so you, you end up having to do things like once the page is stable, uh, then actually do stuff. Uh, and Splinter has lots of very nice helpers built into it for that. Um, and even when it doesn't, uh, even, even when they're insufficient, you can just write your own delay loops with uh, time.monotonic and say, give it some time to stay, settle down and reach the state you're expecting it to reach. Um, and one final question, well, one final point, uh, who here is a PyTest user? Uh, and so. OK, so for you, the concepts in this talk should apply. Um, you probably don't want to use behave. You probably want to use PyTest BDD. Uh, and the reasons for that is you can make, behi you can make behave and PyTest play nicely together. Uh, and I have worked on teams where we have done this for various reasons. You probably don't want to, um, just because some of the details of how they work, they, uh, you end up having to monkey patch behave. To actually, uh, to actually get the PyTest assertions to work correctly. But as far as I'm aware, all of the general concepts in this talk will apply equally well uh, to, these, uh, to doing this with PyTest BDD and PyTest Splinter. So. so yeah, so hopefully if you're like me and historically averse to writing your own GUIs, I've convinced you that basic automated testing of front-end GUIs can be just as straightforward as testing back APIs, back-end APIs and command line applications. Uh, and even if you're already comfortable writing your own dynamic front ends, uh, hopefully you offer this, you learn something about how you might go about writing some automated tests for the expected behavior. So thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. I don't need that. Um, the other thing I'll point out, uh, this talk, almost entirely born from a wonderful uh, two-article series called Beginning BDD with Django, 
uh, by Nicole Harris. Uh, and yes, uh, this is, that's basically where I learned this. Uh, and I really liked it. So, <laughs> hence. <laughs> we got time for a couple of questions. If somebody from an underrepresented group wants to come forward and ask the first question, then we, I open the questions for the room. Hi, Nick. Thanks for a good talk, uh, a great talk. Um, <laughs> do you have any experience with uh, people using Splinter and BDD on Windows or OS X? I do not. Uh, I am thoroughly Linux. This is all running on Linux. Uh, I do have a Windows machine. It is for playing games. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly Blizzard games. Sorry, I think Nicole uses it on Mac, though. So, I think. Hi. Um, I was wondering if uh, um, you've ever had any experience with uh, getting some sort of report about browser compatibility from any of these tools? Uh, I haven't. Uh, I've been fortunate enough that I've only ever needed to use Firefox because it's all been internal tools and we have Firefox as a standard browser. Um, there are services like Source Labs and various this, that, and the other um, where it is specifically set up so you can define your tests once using Selenium WebDriver and they will go run them against a whole swarm of browsers, including mobile browsers. So um, that, that's the difference between doing this, which is basic, um, I need this client to work in one particular environment, and full blown front-end integration testing, um, yeah. Yes, there, there are definitely services that do that. I just, uh, again, that gets back to the, that's the whole world of expertise that is uh, full-on professional front-end development. It's like, yeah, t testing one client is the easy bit. <laughs> yeah, hi, um, good talk. Is there, um, with regard to the race conditions, is there any particular method or approach that you find gives you the highest percentage of success in being able to say, okay, the page is ready, like sticking something at the end of the ready function in jQuery? Or um, So in my case, the one time where I really cared about it, I was also caring about response times. So I wrote some arguably not the way you're supposed to do BDD uh, given steps where I actually had a time limit in the given step. Uh, and then I actually ran the step in a loop to say, uh, it must have met the success condition before the deadline. Um, but yeah, most of, the, uh, most of the things I'm aware of, you, you're either polling the page for an expected state. There is also stuff in um, Selenium and WebDriver to say, wait for an event. Um, actually, one of the other cool things I didn't mention that Splinter has is it actually lets you inject JavaScript uh, into the browser and say, run this JavaScript in the context of the current page. Um, I've personally never needed to use that. I just think it's cool. Um, <laughs> but again, I suspect that could potentially, that would then let you uh, wait for events uh, and stuff. So. Uh, do you have any suggestions for avoiding writing fragile tests where small changes to your UI suddenly start breaking your test suite? Uh, yes, so, so, that, so things like that click link my text. Um, the real nice thing uh, is you can write your tests such that the things will break them are the things that will also break your documentation. Uh, and so it then becomes a case of, hey, my test failed. Oh, that means my docs might be out of date. Uh, and yeah, I act, and uh, Splint, that's one of the reasons I like Splinter because it has those fuzzy, uh, fuzzy things where you can say, uh, give me, click the first link on the page that uses this text. And then the only thing that will break it is if you add another link to the page using the same text. And there are good reasons for not doing that. Um, so, so yes. Uh, uh, um, I think Splinter actually does help encourage writing less fragile tests. So. All right, thank you. We are pretty much out of time. Um, 
There's a coffee break now, and after that, Russell Kiss McGee on here, probably talking about bees. <laughs>